This evening, our sponsors are the Silversides Museum staff who have graciously donated and are underwriting the cost of this program tonight. We have two topics tonight. We're going to be talking about Billy the Riveter. We have a young, engaging lady who we're going to introduce in one second. And we're going to also talk tonight, Muskegon, the Arsenal of Democracy. This is an expansion of a topic we introduced a year ago. Bigger and better, more information than ever. So uh, we have Professor Emeritus, retired, Dan Yakes with us, local author and historian. I think he's written seven or eight different books. And we'll talk about what those books are in just a brief minute. But one of the things I want you to keep in mind it wasn't just Americans who fought that made the difference. As we recall, our weapons weren't always the best. They weren't always the most superior. But what made them better was we could make them. And we could make lots of them very quickly with very willing personnel to do it. And American industry went through a major transformation in the 1940s. I want you to fix on that second set of statistics there. Out of 66 million people that were in the workforce, 19.6 million, or almost 30%, were women. And another element that we have to focus on is the demographic shifts from people coming from the south to the north, people of color, people from rural south coming north to work in these factories as well. Their combined efforts made a big difference in America, the arsenal of democracy. So we're joined today by a young lady who has done a remarkable project. And if we could click on that link there, perhaps, um, so we could bring that project up. Mackenzie Brando. Mackenzie, would you come up here a second? Please come right up here and be acknowledged. Mackenzie is a student at Whitehall High School. Junior, right? Sophomore. Sophomore. That's right. You did this when you were in eighth grade? Okay, this is the website for the Salute to Freedom. They selected 51 different projects across the country. If you would click on the one for Michigan, Mackenzie Brandel's project was cited. And this is Billy the Riveter, and she's going to talk to you about this tonight. So I'm going to get off the stage here because I'm just... I, I'm not worthy to be up here tonight. Look at this. Unbelievable. And if you read these stories, these narratives, these history projects, hers is probably one of the finest. So she was a national winner, and she's been a national winner for the Michigan History Project. Um, last year, was it? Or two years ago? When it, for this project. For this project. Okay. And she's got a new one coming up here in just two weeks. Yep. So she's got a lot going. So I'm going to give her a microphone, and I'm going to go sit down because I want to hear this young lady. So would you give her a round of applause, please? Like you said, I, d I did this project for National History Day when I was in eighth grade. And National History Day is a really cool program where, where, you, can, where you get to... There's an annual theme, like the theme for this project was revolution, reaction, and reform. And you get to do, you can do any topic that you want that's related to that theme. As you can see, for, for this project, I chose to do Rosie the Riveters, except that I, I focused on my, my great-great-aunt Billy, who worked at Continental Motors during the war. And I'll, I'll get more into that as I go along. As I was saying, the women working in the factories during World War II were essential not only because they had to do jobs that the men left vacant, but they also forever changed people's attitudes toward women in the workplace. And you'll kind of see that as I go along. But this, 
I, the theme was revolution, reaction, reform, and I split up my panels into the revolution, reaction, and reform. And, and as we all know, the December 7, 1941 was Pearl Harbor and 16.3 million men volunteer, volunteered to go into the war and the women, and they, they left factory jobs open for the women, so, well, not for the women, but women kind of came in because they were required for to fill the jobs that the men left vacant. And in this this picture, we we saw that on one of the slides. This is actually the original Rosie. It's, this is what most people think of as Rosie, but this is actually the original one. It's um, on May 29, 1943. It was drawn by Norman Rockwell, Rockwell on Saturday Evening Post. And, and she actually got her name because there's a rivet gun on her lap and and she has a lunch pail with the name Rosie on it, so Rosie the Riveter. And these these posters, propaganda posters, were were put out by the government to show that working in the factories could could be glamorous and it could be exciting because because they needed the women to work in the factories. And this picture down here is a picture of the Continental Motors plant on on Getty Street, where my aunt worked during the war, and this these are a few of of the Rosies who work there. In one of the quote that's under that says, "In in towns like Muskegon, home of dozens of defense plants, Rosie's work was done by real life women named Billy Hall, Leona Higginson, Mildred Langloy, Lanch Bird." Eve McHugh, Helen Kinky, Doris Harvey, and many, many more. And and down here is my my aunt Billy, who I mentioned she worked on 47 ton patent medium tank engines, but you know, she's not standing in front of a tank. She is standing in front of an airplane because she originally originally worked on airplane engines, but then got then was converted to tank engines. And and this picture down here, we already we saw on the slide. This is the picture that originally inspired my project. I I saw it on the Muskegon Chronicle. My family saw it, and we were and we were wondering if that was my was my aunt, who was the only woman on the line in the picture, and it was. And I thought it'd be interesting to do a project related to the Rosies with kind of a family theme. And some some of the reactions to the women women working, there were some positives and there were some negatives. And one of the negatives was this 1943 guide to hiring women. It's very uh very bad toward the women. <laughs> Um, one of the quotes says, pick young married women. They usually have more of a sense of responsibility than their unmarried sisters. They are less likely to be flirtatious. They need the work or they would not be doing it. They s still have the peppant interest to work hard and to deal with the public efficiently. And another one says, general experience indicates the husky girls, those who are just a little on the heavy side, are more even-tempered and efficient than their underweight sisters. <laughs> Another, another example is give the female employee a definite day-long schedule of duties so that they will keep busy without bothering the management for instructions every few minutes. And worst properties say that women make excellent workers when they have their jobs cut out for them, but the, that they lack initiative in finding work themselves. <laughs> another one says give every girl an adequate number of rest periods during the day. You have to make some allowances for feminine psychology. A girl has more confidence and is more efficient if she can keep her hair tidied, apply fresh lipstick, and wash her hands several times a day. <laughs> and there, the positive reactions that, obviously women felt that they were helping to win the war. They liked working with their friends and making their own money so that they could be more independent and not just be housewives. And there, like I meant, like this, there were some negative reactions in that the men didn't like the women taking their jobs because they thought 
women couldn't do as good of a job, but women proved them wrong, obviously. And, but that did show in women's pay, which is and still is often less than that of men. And the mothers had difficulty balancing their schedules with young children at home. They, they had to hire babysitters or use daycare. And this comic has an interesting story. I found it in one of the diaries of one of the Rosies that I read during the war. And, and she is, this picture of this Rosie, she's working on a machine and she broke it. And her boss was not happy. So, and he asked her, helping Hitler again, huh? And, but later she did redeem herself and in her words, he called me babe. <laughs> and, and the Rosies re reform, reformed a couple things, or a lot of things, but I mentioned a couple things. They, they improved safety because the conditions could be dangerous and some of the women didn't have good training but the training became better as the tasks were broken down and implementing the safety rules made the factory safer and like my my aunt said they wouldn't let people work under these conditions anymore but i loved it i loved my job and even though in one of the instances i read she she was working and she she slipped in battery acid and it, it ate up all of her, her clothes and everything. And that couldn't have been good. <laughs> and they, the Rosies also caused a social reform. They, they changed fashion because they showed that women didn't always have to be pretty and wear dresses and wear makeup, that they could, they could get dirty and wear, wear jeans and wear, and do the jobs that the, that it was always thought that just the men could do. And the, one of the Rosies I interviewed in Muskegon worked at Clark Flooring winding armatures for airplane motors, and she didn't like that the women couldn't get leave. She said, I had to quit every time I had a baby. You didn't get any seniority when you were gone. Today, they can get seniority. And the unions fought for better working get conditions and saved women's jobs after the war. One of the Rosies I interviewed, Noreen Flickema, she worked at Anaconda Wiring for, during the war, at the beginning of the war, and she wanted to go see her husband who was stationed in, in Florida for the time being, and, and her boss wouldn't let her do that, and he said, to do that, you'll have to quit. So she said, I quit. And when she came back, she had a relative who was working at Norge Machine Products, and she got a job there. And later, the unions called her and told her that they had no right to fire you at Anaconda, so, so you can have your job back. But she said, no, I, I made 40 cents an hour at Anaconda, and I made a dollar, I'm making a dollar twenty at Norge, so I'm going to stay at Norge. <laughs> And I have a chart down here that's, that's showing how much the women's work has, has grown since the time of the Rosies. It's amazing how much it's grown since then. And in 1963, John F. Kennedy signed the Equal Pay Act, and like I mentioned today, equal pay for women is still being promoted. And well, many of the six million Rosies returned to being housewives and stay-at-home mothers after the war. Others stay in their jobs and help start the women's liberation movement in the 1960s. Today, thanks to these revolutionary heroes, 58.6% of the workforce is comprised of women, including NASCAR racers, mechanics, judges, astronauts, and CEOs, as shown in the pictures down there. And this was what, a toolbox I borrowed from one of the roses that I interviewed, and I'm still borrowing it two years later. <laughs> and and this is a picture of her with, with her brother as her brother was leaving the war. And this is a picture of my Aunt Billy's badge as, as she, she was working at Continental. But you know, if you look at it, it doesn't say Billy. It says Wilda, because Wilda was actually her real name. Everyone just called her Billy. I don't know why. And this is a scrapbook of, of things that I acquired while doing this project. This, this first item in here is a 
certificate from the American Rosie the Riveter Association that I got to be, I, I'm a rosebud because my, because my Aunt Billy worked during the war, I was qualified to do that. And, do, 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 do. and this is um, whenever you employ women, like suggestions, it's like saying limit her to eight hours a day and, and 48 a week if possible, and arrange brief rest periods in the middle of each shift, and try to make nourishing foods available for, for lunch periods. And these are some of the Rosies that I interviewed, Maxine and Irene and Noreen, as I, I mentioned a couple of them in earlier. And this is, I love this comic. It's a Peanuts comic. It's Lucy talking, giving a report to her class. And she's saying, and so World War II came to an end. My grandmother left her job in the defense plant and went to work for the telephone company. We need to study the lives of great women like my grandmother. Talk to your own grandmother today. Ask her questions. You'll find she knows more than peanut butter cookies. Thank you. And, and those are the Rosie that let me borrow the toolbox. She also let me borrow a couple of her employee handbooks from when she was working at Continental Airlines and Remington Arms in Colorado. And this is just a bigger picture you can see. Flip it. You can see Billy more clearly in this picture because that one's kind of small. So, oh yeah, and that's the Rosie the Riveter song. I will not sing it. <laughs> you wouldn't want to hear me sing it. And these, these were actually a couple of my grandparents. They, they're ration tokens from during the war. They let me have those. And... Oh, yeah, woman power. Woman power is a headache because, because it involves a complete dislocation of normal routine. Consequently, most women neither understand it nor like it, men even less. The more, but the more women at work, the sooner we'll win. And, and this is actually a picture of, like, a storefront in Muskegon during the war saying, buy war bonds at Grossman's and battle flags over Muskegon, a mighty stronghold on the production front. And this, I, I got to tour, got special permission to tour the L3 communications defense plant, which was actually, it used to be Continental Motors where my Aunt Billy worked. And they, apparently they liked me. <laughs> And they, yeah, like I said, they let me tour and, and they sent me this encouraging, encouraging me to do well at nationals. And it definitely helped. I think, yeah, that's just an article. There's, I think, I think that was it. Yeah. You might want to clarify that's your great, great aunt. Yes, I, I originally said that. I was just saving, saving breath. <laughs> okay. Can you take some questions? Yep. All right, anybody have some questions for Mackenzie? Yes. Excuse me, is there anything in your research It, it just, it was amazing the, the negative impacts that Rosies were still seeing even though they were helping to win the war. The negative impacts from the men the, that didn't like them working even though, like I said, they were helping to win the war. And that was just amazing to me. Yes? In, in your opinion from your research, did it seem to get any better as the war progressed and the women were doing better? Did, it, did, they, did the women feel more like they belonged or no? Yeah, I, I saw many instances of that, including my aunt who loved working in the factory at Continental Motors in Muskegon. Great. Mackenzie, over here. Um, did the women find it difficult to stay in the workforce once the men came back from war? Yes, they, they did. And, and 
it showed in the 50s when women were generally portrayed as being housewives and not, not being in the men's jobs like they were in the 40s. Um, my mother was a worker during the war, um, and she married my father, became pregnant, and the boss told her, it figures, you're a woman, and I knew this was a bad idea. Oh. <laughs> True story. Mackenzie, you seem like exactly the type of student we would love to have in our classes. What are your plans? I know you're just a sophomore. Will we see you at MCC in the future? What are your plans to study? I am not sure yet. You might see me at MCC, but I, I definitely want to go into something related to history. So. Well, you are very welcome on our campus anytime. <laughs> We'd love you in this class. Any other questions? I don't have a question. I just want, I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say how proud we are to have young people like you do projects like this and keep this World War II on, on, top of the, uh, on top of the pile, and we're just so proud of you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you for a fine presentation. I just want to tell you that my cousin, who is in her 80s and lives in Muskegon, told me just about a year ago that she worked at uh, an automobile factory for... Uh, military. She adjusted the valves on the engines while the engines were running. I was quite impressed. Well, Mackenzie, I guess we're live here. We do want you to pursue your dream, pursue your education, and here is a token of our appreciation to put us a, down, a deposit on the first book because the books will cost what this check is worth. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you so very, 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 very much for coming back and sharing the story with us. I love doing it. Wonderful. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. That's great. Thank you. I'll take that one from you. Well, it's always good to see a young student who is pursuing her passions. All right. Well, we have another person that lived his passions who will be presenting here tonight, uh, Dr. D uh, Dan um, Yates. Yakes, excuse me, is a consummate professional. 42 years he spent teaching at Muskegon Community College. He is a wonderful historian who's captured not only Muskegon's history, but he's done some very unique projects, including the Mexican-American influence in Muskegon, the White Lake Yacht Club history and how it impacted White Lake, um, he's also traced the logging um, efforts in the time of uh, the late 1800s. And he's a treasure trove of in information, and he does a wonderful job in producing these wonderful local histories. Well, we're pleased to bring back tonight Dr. Yakes. Dan? I'd like to introduce Stephen Demos, Dr. Demos. He's right over here. He, uh, he's my uh, partner, co-host, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the last four books uh, we co-authored. I did the research and writing. He did all the graphics in them. And we're currently working on another one, The Medical History of Muskegon County. Uh, we're up through uh, the war. So you're going to hear something about the medical aspect of World War II tonight. Uh, some of you are students. I, we handed out an outline to you, and in there, uh, along with it, is a, another sheet done by a, a former colleague, uh, Hugh Hornstein, who um, put that together. We used to have a course a little bit like this one at the college called Muskegon Area Studies, and we would offer it to the public as well as to the um, paying students and uh, uh, tuition-paying students. And um, one of those programs was uh, World War, all, all the wars. We crammed all the wars into one night. I mean, nothing like this. But uh, uh, World War II uh, entailed a, a lot of rationing at home. And so attached to your outline, I gave you a couple of, of um, tokens, a red token 
and a blue token. Those were used during the latter days of the war to make change for coupons. When you turn something in for a pair of shoes or a, a, a loaf of bread or something like that, you would get change back, and the, each of those was worth a penny. Today they're worth at least 40 cents a piece, I found on the token market. And uh, if you happen to have a red MV, it's worth 20 bucks. So you could have one. I don't know. I didn't check out the numbers. They have little uh, numbers or letters on them, each one. Each has two letters. So check them out and see if they're worth anything. Uh, tonight we're going to start with um, the um, Depression, the Great Depression, because, of course, that all led into the war itself. Uh, we start here with a, this is just a drawing, an image of, of a destitute man uh, uh, out of work, clearly no hope on the horizon. But that isn't what the uh, record companies were telling us. This was back in the early 30s now, uh, before uh, Roosevelt came into office. And the uh, administration at that time was thinking this would be a short-term Recession. It wouldn't last very long. Just think positively. Uh, pennies from heaven will fall or things are going to get better. One of my favorite songs was an Irving Berlin number called Just Around the Corner. I was going to play one for you, but I'll just sing a little bit. Just around the corner, there's a rainbow in the sky. So let's have another cup of coffee and let's have another piece of pie. Well, if anybody had any money, they sure wouldn't spend wasted on pie. They'd get a loaf of bread and have a, a real meal or something like that. Um, later on in that, uh, I should mention, too, that I discovered that was an Irving Berlin number, but it was recorded by Brunswick. And you probably are aware that Brunswick had its recording studio here in Muskegon, and they produced uh, most of their platters here in Muskegon. So that may very well have been produced here, for all I know. Um, later in the uh, Depression, of course, you didn't have gay numbers like that. They, they were pretty somber because conditions were bad. Here in Muskegon, uh, we had about 35 to 40 percent unemployment. Uh, people, and of course, hard to figure because the government wasn't keeping very good records. We didn't have uh, federal government uh, assistance programs at that time. But uh, those people simply um, had no work. Some of them went on the road, uh, had no place to go. If they had family, uh, maybe they came from a family farm, they would go home and, and work on the farm. At least they had a place to stay. The kids would get three square meals a day probably. Uh, you could plant gardens and, and fields and tend the flocks, and uh, you, you would have meals at least. So uh, times were really tough. And again, Muskegon, if we could move to the next slide, uh, this is another example. Of course, you'd stand in line. This is either an unemployment line or it could possibly be a bread line. And these are not just ordinary workers. I mean, these are well-dressed men. Uh, the Depression didn't just affect poor people. It affected everybody. And uh, uh, people who had been pretty prosperous lost everything. My own family, my grandfather lost his farm. He, he lost his uh, automobile dealership lost his gas station, wound up becoming a beekeeper. Uh, and I mean, times were really tough. And this, the, he was a prosperous man prior to the war. Could you go to the next one, please? Now, here's uh, downtown Muskegon. Uh, I just want to point, many of these places are gone now. And so this is mostly for the younger set who aren't familiar with this. Most of our industry in Muskegon was located right along the lakefront. And so at the very top, you have... Uh, the Continental plant, it was quite large. That's the original Continental plant. That's not the one where Billy the Riveter worked. Uh, and then next to it was Lakey Foundry, which in the late 30s was owned by Continental, or uh, by Continental Motors and produced many of their foundry products. And then as you come south and west, many, many others. Uh, as you get way over to the far uh, left-hand side, you'll see the um, pulp plant, the, uh, they were making paper products, craft paper. Um, some of those buildings are still there. And in between you have uh, the amalgamated um, uh, wire company. Uh, they made wire products, mostly electromagnets though. They would take copper wire and wind it around another gizmo and make things for electric motors and, and so forth. 
The other area was, of course, southern Muskegon, the uh, city of Muskegon, and down in the Heights. So right along uh, Broadway, which is at the very bottom, you had a whole bunch of, of uh, factories and, and uh, foundries. And then right along Getty Street, you had the Campbell White Cannon, uh, pardon me, the, the uh, Campbell White Cannon uh, foundry. They had another foundry on Sanford. And uh, so that's where most of it was concentrated. But some of these were locally owned outfits. Um, Campbell White and Cannon, for example, and Shaw Walker which along the lakefront. Uh, but again, keep, keep in mind they are making products for other companies or they're making um, essentially luxury goods. So they're dependent on a, an audience that wasn't there anymore. If, if Shaw Walker, for example, who needs a new desk in depression times? There were enough companies going out of business. You could buy one for practically nothing. They were selling them for kindling wood in some places. So they're down to part-time. Uh, if you were Campbell White Cannon, you're probably making uh, uh, cores or some, some other foundry product for an automobile. But who's buying automobiles in the Depression? Uh, only the very wealthy. And uh, they weren't buying all that many. They were making uh, parts for Ford and for Chevrolet. Leakey was doing that. Too. So the products they're producing were not uh, real popular during the Depression. So that's why we have much higher unemployment than normally you would find in a, perhaps another community that was making consumer products that people absolutely had to have to survive. The, um, could we go to the next one, please? Uh, this is one of the saviors of the city, and, and uh, this is L.C. Walker. He, of course, is a very conservative guy, isolationist, a lot like uh, Henry Ford and Lindbergh and others. Very definitely didn't want to go to war. I uh, thought wars were futile and stupid. Can't we work these things out? But when uh, the Depression hit, he introduced a, a plan called the Share the Work Plan. Share the Work Plan was a, an idea that many, many locally owned companies followed. The big companies didn't. In a big company like Ford, for example, that was privately owned, but it was a much bigger company. Um, in a big company, in Depression times, you cut back by firing or laying off the lowest rung of the totem pole, the unskilled workers, the ones who have been recently hired. And then you had to reshuffle everything. So the... Uh, Semi-skilled worker took the job of the unskilled worker. The uh, skilled worker took the job of the semi-skilled worker. The foreman took the job of the skilled worker. The supervisor took the job of the foreman. So you had everybody working out of position. And they really didn't do a very good job because they weren't familiar. I mean, they had done it 10 years ago, but they hadn't done it lately. And then, of course, you lose all of the workers that you were training to bring them up. With the share of the work plan, you kept all your employees, except they only worked part-time. So if you had half the amount of work that you'd had before the Depression, you uh, worked three days a week. Uh, you kept your same job. Everybody knew what they were doing. They, and then so when the Depression ends and the war starts, you have the, the workforce you started with. You're going to hire some new people, of course. And some of those workers are going to go to war. But by and large, you're going to have a very capable workforce uh, that can do the job for you. You don't have to retrain everybody. So a company that wasn't doing that, of course, is going to have a big problem when the war began because you're going to lose, in Muskegon, over 10,000 workers. And you're going to replace them with 20,000 new ones. So the less you can retrain, the better. Of course, everybody's going to have to retrain. All right, can we go to the next one, please? This is the Shaw Walker plant. Uh, much of it is still there. It's uh, right along the lakeshore, very close to the lakeshore. You can recognize it if you want. And can we go to the next, please? Now, this is the uh, Roosevelt family. They, uh, he came into office in, as president. He had been governor of New York uh, in uh, November of 1932. Uh, Walker and, and Roosevelt knew one another. Um, <clears throat> Walker and his papers are over at the University of Michigan, that, not Roosevelt's papers, but uh, Walker's papers. And they wrote back and forth. Of course, they didn't agree on much of anything. But uh, uh, Walker had, for a couple of years, been the president of NAM, the National Alliance of Manufacturers, one of the most conservative business 
oriented companies or, or associations in the country. It still exists. Last I heard, uh, Governor, former Governor Engler was working there, but I don't know if he's still involved or not. But uh, quite conservative. And of course, uh, Roosevelt was fairly liberal. He's seated here with his mother. He had this fixation with his mother. Uh, their bedrooms were next to one another at uh, their home along the Hudson. And you see Eleanor is in the back there. She's sort of relegated to the rear. But I want to bring your attention to the couple at the far left. The tall man there is <clears throat> one of uh, Roosevelt's sons. That's Elliot Roosevelt. Next to him is Ruth Guggen Roosevelt. She's from Whitehall. Uh, she was born, raised there, met uh, Elliot somewhere or another. I think he was visiting Sylvan Beach. Uh, and uh, they married and, and uh, had several children there. Son comes to the Sylvan Beach every summer nowadays. I've met him. Steve uh, still blames me for not getting to meet him. But uh, anyway, I think he met his wife, though, Elliot Jr.'s wife. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> they're there every summer. So that's sort of a local connection that we might not have ordinary thought, uh, ordinarily thought about. All right, Eleanor, in, in some ways, was sort of the real liberal in the family. Uh, uh, fr Franklin, mm, wishy-washy, but... Of course, they must have had pillow talks at night, and Eleanor probably prevailed. Um, all right, I'm not getting this one. Oh, that one. No, that turned it off. Okay, why don't we just go back and you do it yourself, all right? Technology, this is why we need Steve around on account of I can't handle these things. All right, then we move to the next one here. This, again, if the far left, that's Ruth Guggen at Sylvan Beach. I don't remember the names of the other two gals. Uh, a few pictures of downtown Muskegon. Again, you old-timers uh, haven't seen these for a while, perhaps. If you're under, oh, say, 30 or 40, you've never seen uh, the original buildings here. This was part of a mall, at, or the, the far distant one is part of a mall at one time. This is a Michigan theater on the right. It's called the Froenthal today. This is Western Avenue looking roughly east. All right, could we move to the next? Here again we have... Uh, Western Avenue, but a color picture of it in this case. This uh, it may be a familiar, it's, back in the logging days, this was called Riefenberg's Hall. It was sort of a, the place where you would meet if you're going to have an assembly. There'd be, they, they had a big meeting there during the big uh, strike of 1881-82. You may remember it, though, as the House of Chan. Back when it was downtown, the lower level was Walt Plant's appliance store, and, of course, up, up above, the second story was the House of Chan. And by golly, I mean, that was real Chinese food. I mean, you could go there, the faculty would go there twice a year, the whole faculty from community college, and we'd all sit around this long table, and each would order a different delicacy, and then we would share. So we all got to learn what other people like, you see. All right, move on. All right. Here's Pearl Harbor. Um, again, uh, uh, December 7th, 1941, day shall, that shall last in infamy. And of course, uh, move to the next picture. Uh, this, um, it's sort of like Kennedy's assassination and the attack on the World Trade Centers. If you were alive and kicking at the time that event occurred, you know exactly where you were and what you were doing when that happened. And in this case, they were probably listening to the radio. And um, they received news, of, and all the kids were unhappy because they were listening to the shadow. The shadow knows Lamont Cranston and his, I guess she was a fiance, <clears throat> um, Lamar, uh, I can't remember his fiance's name, but uh, they interrupted at 2.30, a little after 2.30, and uh, with the announcement that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Of course, uh, there's about six hours difference between Pearl Harbor to seven hours difference, so that, uh, that attack was uh, earlier in the morning of, in Pearl Harbor. Move to the next, please. And again, Congress declared war. This is, I think, I can't read from here. Is this the one for Japan? Yes, that's the Japanese declaration of war. We have that same picture down below, Steve... Um, reproduced it, and it's part of the entryway here. And then the next one should be a declaration of war against Germany. <clears throat> Again, depending upon the 
um, your orientation. I would say, though, that most Americans were uh, pissed off more with Japan than they were with Germany. Uh, again, it depended a little bit upon your own heritage and background, uh, but um, uh, obviously the, the, uh, the conflict was with both of them. Uh, this, of course, is Homer Hart. He was our first Muskegon casualty of the war. I mentioned last time that I had heard he died of injuries at Pearl Harbor, but apparently he, died, he, he uh, lived some time after that, but died later on. At that same attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, another local uh, young man from Whitehall again, um, Stanley Hall, um, was on one of the battleships, Arizona, I think, and uh, he participated in the battle in his underwear. He had a turret gun or something like that and fired off some shots. He was not injured, but he left a lovely diary of his uh, activities, which is well worth reading if you, or using in a book or paper if you want to. Could we move on to the next one, please? And again, here's the Declaration on, uh, Against Germany. Oh, we're using the new one. This one wasn't in the, the version I gave you. Here's the armory. This is the... Uh, uh, National Guard Armory. Uh, most of our local contingent were part of Company G of uh, the 170 something battalion, and that was the medical company. Uh, now, there were only a few doctors associated with it and, and some nurses. Uh, there were a lot of corpsmen, and it was a uh, nation, it was statewide uh, uh, company, and they were called up well before the war began. Uh, uh, over a year before the war began to prepare for the war because the administration was convinced there would be some activity. Even if they couldn't help uh, an American force, perhaps they could help Canadian forces or British forces uh, in the event. Of course, already uh, the Germans were attacking um, Britain and, and the Japanese were attacking various places in southeastern Asia. So they were preparing for a conflict, whether or not the United States entered the war. So could we move to the next one? Now, again, I toss this one in here. This is Mercy Hospital. That, that's the original, well, the second Mercy Hospital. First one was a wooden um, mansion belonging once to Lyman G. Mason. This was faced onto Jefferson. It was a very fine hospital. And I bring this up because, again, during the Depression, um, they had uh, been really overwhelmed with, um, with uh, people needing help. Uh, at one time, I thought they had to cut staff, but it turns out they increased staff because of the need during the war. Uh, hospitals work counter to ordinary businesses, just like community colleges work counter to ordinary businesses. When everybody else is struggling economically, colleges and uh, hospitals bloom. They do very well because depression makes people ill. You know, there's a lot of connection there, and they can't afford uh, other places to go. So uh, actually they increased uh, uh, personnel during the depression and increased it again when the war began. Now, we mentioned wages. Um, I've now discovered that uh, nurses there uh, if they were paid, were paid $4 a day. That is not $4 an hour. $4 a day for six days a week. If they entered the Army or Navy as an Army or Navy nurse, you were an officer, and base pay was $1,300 a year. So in other words, if you entered the Army or Navy, you got free food, you got free lodging, you got... Uh, um, $1,300 a year, which is over double what they would have earned in civilian life. And of course, during the Depression, they were being paid um, little more than room and board because they needed work. These women did not have jobs. Plus, they used a lot of student nurses during the war as well, uh, the Depression as well as the war. Move to the next one. The next one's Hackley. Hackley no longer exists in this capacity. This is a uh, the original Hackley, it faced onto Forest, which is a, they're facing north. Today it faces to the west. And again, they had a similar size 
Uh, they had 125 rooms. They had the same basic staff. And again, they paid basically the same wages that uh, Mercy paid on to the next. Oh, well, we got some of the new ones in here. I don't know. You must have done some magic. Um, the Navy, of course, and the Army both recruited nurses. Um, Muskegon produced over 80 nurses who served in the war, uh, either in the Navy or the Army. And, of course, there were also some cadet nurses. These were, in other words, the government would pay a young woman to, or man, but they didn't have any male nurses in Muskegon. Uh, they weren't eligible until the 60s. But, um, see, there's, this prejudice goes both ways. Uh, so you could uh, enter uh, nursing school, and the government would pay your tuition and all of your expenses, and you'd have to promise after graduating to go into the Navy or the Army. Now, of course, they didn't start that until 43, and they didn't graduate until 46, and by that time, of course, the war was over, so some of them did not, were not obliged to fulfill their commitment, but still they could earn more in the Navy or Army than they could here, back here at home. By that time, they were paying $10 a day back home. All right, on to the next, please. This is just an example of the housing barracks. This is a bar barracks in, in England that was used um, uh, during the war. Not all that bad, you know, unless the uh, Blitzkrieg is on and they're attacking the uh, barracks. Uh, not too bad, con considering the alternatives. Please, on to the next one. Again, both of our, uh, all of our schools locally produced a large number of graduates every year. This is from Muskegon High School. And uh, this said and done, this is their annual publication. Um, in the case of said and done, they produced one every month during the school year. Uh, so a graduate uh, from there, of course, uh, normally would be expected to enter either the Army or the Navy. There's, again, no Air Force yet. Uh, the Air Force was connected to the Army, and the Marine Corps, of course, was connected with the Navy. So there were really only two branches of service. On to the next, please. And, of course, this is a cartoonist version. Uh, your, your high school teacher says goodbye. You go across the street, go to the draft board, and before you know it, you're either in the Army or the Navy. If you're wise, of course, you would just enlist and not worry about the draft because you're going to get drafted anyway. You know. All right, on to the next, please. Now, again, during the war, it would not be uncommon, particularly for officers, to return home. So we have a, an example of some of our local Muskegon graduates coming back to uh, pay homage to their coach. This is Coach Redmond. He's the third one across there. Please, to the next one. And again, these are some of the yearbook examples of some of the servicemen who went off to war. Uh, and their names are given there. I'm sure Richard Mullally, who collects these kinds of things, can, has already used up all of these pictures. On to the next, please. And again, some more pictures of, of high school graduates and their sweethearts in this case. Uh, again, we often forget about the sweetheart left home. Uh, the songs of that time in the 40s were often about lovers uh, who had to part during the war. And, and uh, oh, let's see, I'm... I'm going to wait for you under the uh, apple tree or something like that. I, all kinds of songs. They don't usually deal with uh, the wartime conflict. They had to do with romance and, and breaking up of families and that sort of thing. The one example that doesn't fit that was uh, uh, Bugle Boy of uh, the, bu the Bunker, yeah, Andrew Sisters. Apparently, uh, somebody told me, and maybe it was Richard Mullally, that... Um, the Bugle Boy may very well have been a Muskegon graduate. Um, you know, is that right? Are you the one who told me that? Well, maybe, maybe not, but uh, there are quite a few buglers in Muskegon. Uh-huh, and he could have been one of them. Okay, the uh, boogie-woogie Bugle Boy, of a lot of, uh, a lot of bees in there, all right? So let's move on to the next one here. Again, here's the community college. This is when it was in the Hackley Building, but it was also in... Vanderlaan Building and the Wilson Building and another building on Apple Street and three or four more. Now, if you were enlisted, chances are you were sent to a training facility. And here in, Mus in Michigan, of course, the closest was Fort Custer. And this is what you would experience if you went to Fort Custer. Or you might be sent to the next place, Southridge Field. Again, particularly if you were going into the Army Air Corps, this is an early picture of Southridge Field, which is over near uh, Mount Clemens. Um, 
And there was another base up in the Upper Peninsula, but I didn't have a picture of that. I don't know of any others in Michigan, but maybe the other people know better than I do. On to the next, please. Now, again, we've already heard uh, the propaganda. I mean, unlike more modern wars, the federal government really beat the crap out of this concept. We have to keep production high at home because our boys across the sea are are in need of, of munitions and of tanks and of, of engines and all the other things that American factories were producing. And uh, this was hammered home to everybody who was working a, sh a shift in any factory, practically. On to that. Now, again, this shows you some of the uh, factories and, and other locations. I do want to point out that Muskegon was different than it is today. The boundaries were not the same. Uh, this whole section in here was part of Muskegon Township. And then, of course, it doesn't go any further than what would be the expressway there. So, again, when we look at next topic, which is where people were residing, uh, the city didn't really particularly want any of these residential facilities that we're about to look at. Instead, they wanted them to be in the township. So we could we go to the... Next one, well, we're not quite there yet. Uh, what we're going to look at here are some of the factories. Now, we're looking here down at the uh, shoreline toward the head of the lake, and basically over there on the left-hand side at the top, that's the original Getty Street plant. It's a huge facility. Even in peacetime, they had 10 or 12,000 employees during peak employment. Down to the lower left, is the Lakey Foundry. And that was again owned by Campbell Wine Ken by that time, by the time of the war. That was right near downtown. On to the next, please. We're looking at some facts. Here's the Getty Street plan. That's pretty much the same as it was, except as over on the left hand side there, you see it's basically a proving ground. It was all open, it's all kind of forested in today. But uh, another huge plant. That was built during the war, uh, or at the be very beginning of the war. The United States hadn't entered the war yet, but it was going on in Europe. And uh, uh, again, because Continental got this big contract. Again, war doesn't begin until the very end of 41, but Continental got this huge tank engine contract in January of uh, 40, uh, 1940. And they got another big contract for aircraft uh, engines, Pratt & Whitney engines, uh, later on that same year. Again, part of this was part of the Lend-Lease concept where Americans were producing equipment for the British and other allied nations. Uh, but again, the production had begun long before the United States actually entered the war. On to the next, we're just going to take a look at some of their products. Now again, Catwine Cannon was the biggest industrial employer in the county. 21,000 employees at, at their peak during the war in the two plants. But they didn't make any products that could stand alone. Again, they're dependent on contracts from other companies. So they were making the engines for many, many different aircraft. And we'll just run through these to save some time. Uh, these are tank engines. These are, this is the Warren plant. But uh, Continental made the engines for the, for the Sherman tank. Uh, and others, and they made uh, them for what became the Jeep, uh, sort of an all-terrain vehicle still around. Uh, another picture of a Jeep. These are just all pictures of vehicles or apparatus that uh, engines went into. Here's another picture of a Jeep, that's sort of like desert rats or something like that from World War II, another Jeep. Um, we just move on through until we get to the name. This is a little after the war, uh, but uh, this displays all of the products that Continental made basically by this time in the early 50s. So trucks and tanks, and they don't show any aircraft here, but they were making them as well. All right, move on to the next. Now what we have here, this is the Campbell Wyden Cannon foundry on, this is the one on uh, Getty. And uh, again, I think their biggest one, I think it was number two, Henry Street? Oh, sorry. Well, I got a big glare, and I can't see what I'm looking at. So it's the one on, on uh, Henry. They had another one on Sanford. This is still the one on Henry, though. And uh, over to the right, you can't see it. There's a big uh, 
uh, trailer park where a lot of their workers stayed. Uh, we can't see it, don't have a picture. This is the one on Sanford. That's the one where, where Steve worked when he was a kid. Uh, on to the next. Uh, that's again, uh, can't, well, that's can't wind the cannon again, but they had this bridge that connected the two sides across the street. Uh, it's all gone now, Nothing, none of that's left as far as I know. On to the next, please. Uh, I'm having a hard time seeing, what is that? Brunswick, okay. Well, Brunswick, we've mentioned already, was making uh, phonograph records and phonographs and stuff like that. They were not like modern day phonographs, these were wind up phonographs. You may not remember them unless you're quite old. We had one in my house. But they're particularly known for making billiard tables and um, uh, bowling equipment, bowling balls, bowling pins, um, that kind of thing. During the war, they're going to make a lot of other things. They didn't make many billiard tables. Not big demand for billiard and pool tables in wartime, except in officers' quarters. Um, here's another one, the Norge. Again, that one time that had been Alaska f refrigerator. They made wooden refrigerators, but when Norge took them over, they started making things out of metal, uh, refrigerators and stoves and that kind of thing. During the war, they will make other. Here's another picture of the Norge. Uh, could we move on to the next one? Here's a seal of power. They were making um, piston rings of many different sizes. Uh, that was another of the big locally owned businesses here in Muskegon. On to the next. Fitzjohn buses. <clears throat> During the war, they just continued making the same buses they had always made, plus some trucks. And these were used at Army and Navy bases all over the country, transporting troops from one place to another on the base or from off base onto the base. Uh, an important Muskegon company one time. On to the next, please. Cadon. Uh, Cadon was uh, uh, created during the war. This is the Froenthal-owned company. Uh, they, that's the Froenthal family that donated to create the Froenthal Center, downtown Muskegon, another of our local group of families that invested in Muskegon's future. Um, they were making uh, basically uh, ball bearings and ball bearing turrets, mostly used on uh, aircraft. Uh, aircraft guns, the shooting down planes. The next one will show you that. That's one of their turrets. Uh, good indication of that. They didn't all get that big, of course. That was the biggest they made. On to the next, please. Uh, here we have, that's the Amazon. The Amazon building is still there. It's used as a condo now. They did not have much <clears throat> activity during the war. They made basically cotton underwear. And uh, so they did get a big contract to make underwear for the Army, but they lost their contract by 43. The problem was they had almost all women workers, and they were accustomed to paying them practically nothing. So when the war plant started <coughs> producing real war goods, not underwear, they were paying a lot more money. So all these women who had worked there um, quit and moved on to a better paying job. I mean, after all, if they can earn three or four times doing a similar kind of work, why wouldn't they do that? So uh, the Amazon went out of business during the war, never reopened. All right, on to something else. Here's another picture of the Amazon building. <clears throat> now this is in here because Muskegon had a very strange configuration. Um, there are two major industries in Muskegon County. One was the big factories, foundries, and so forth, mostly in Muskegon, but um, we also had a big tourist industry, mostly on the White Lake area, and uh, also down around Mona Lake, and a little bit in North Muskegon, uh, but mostly the White Lake area. So <clears throat> the war impacted all of that. As we're about to see, um, automobiles were impossible to get. So that's obviously going to impact the resort industry. Uh, the Goodrich line was out of business. Um, the trains didn't go that far north anymore, passenger trains. <clears throat> so all those businesses are going to just suffer during. Oh, why something happened here? Now it's back. All right. I don't know what happened. I guess that was a chance for me to clear my throat. So, uh, for example, the Old Channel Trail golf course had to close up. They had no, 
business and they had nobody who wanted to work there because they didn't pay very well compared to the factories. So uh, lots of other things were happening in Muskegon, but I'm going to concentrate on the, the uh, industrial aspect rather than the tourist aspect. You can read a couple of my books if you want. Now, again, the employment of women. I don't remember hearing the figure from McKenzie about the percentage of women workers, but Muskegon County, we had a big uh, census during the war, 44, and throughout the county, 45,000 workers. Now, some of them were not in industry. About 30,000 were in industry, and of the 30,000, about 5,000 were women. So I don't think we were quite as heavy a an employer of women as other places might have been. And that may reflect some of the biases on the part of personnel agents or some such thing. I don't know. Plenty of women available. The women, of course, were typically unmarried, not always. Uh, they typically came from rural areas of the county and outside of the county. And again, attracted. It wasn't unusual for a, a wife to, uh, her husband was away at war and she would go to work. What else is there to do? She, her husband's gone. Maybe she doesn't have children. Uh, and so going to work would be quite commonplace for her. So let's move on to the next one here. Uh, again, <clears throat> this is a picture of the farmer's market at that time. And I have it in here because as you look from face to face, you will see light faces and dark faces. Muskegon is going to attract... Uh, families and laborers from really all over the country, but mostly from the south and from the area around Muskegon and from the area around Chicago. We have the actual <coughs> percentages. Uh, 19,000 brand new workers come into the county during the war. That doesn't count their families. Those are just the workers. About 11,000 are from the uh, immediate area around Muskegon. I thought it, that's kind of a high figure, but that's what the census says. About four to 5,000 of them are Mexican-Americans from Texas. Another three to 4,000 are African-Americans, mostly from Arkansas, Mississippi, and another couple, 3,000 from Appalachia, Appalachian whites. I don't know if that comes out to 20,000, but comes pretty close. So. They're, they're recruited, typically. Um, if we can move on to the next picture. Uh, women, of course, are, are recruited um, from all over the county and from other places. Uh, this woman seems to be working at Seal Power or maybe the other, uh, one of the other companies. She's uh, testing. All right, on to the next, please. And here we have another woman working. I can't see her very well, but I think she's testing... Pistons, something like that. It, I can't quite make it out. On to the next. I wanted to mention this. <clears throat> Mackenzie mentioned how the war changed habits. Um, for one thing, uh, wearing slacks and dungarees became acceptable. Not just to go to work. Obviously, it made sense to go to work in a pair of pants rather than a, a skirt. But uh, these became popular away from work, whether you're going off... And again, part of it was because nylons weren't available. Another part of it was because um, the manufacturers of, of skirts had decided to save money and cloth. They should make the skirts shorter. The men thought that was a good idea, but some of these women didn't think so. And uh, so it just made sense, uh, especially if you were sensitive about your legs, to um, wear pants. And of course, today, what would we be without, <laughs> without pants? Uh, most women probably prefer them to skirts on most occasions, at least many occasions. Right on to the next one here. Again, we have more workers. These women are working in a box factory. That may be um, one of our local factories. It is one of our local factories, but I don't remember which one. Let me see if I can find it. It appears to be a press of some sort. May the, you know, that could be the Nords. They could be making panels for the side of a refrigerator or a or a, a, uh, an isobox. Uh, all right, let's move on. Here again, we have a working line. This, this is Continental, uh, putting the final touches on, a, on a, uh, an engine. On to the next. Now, we want to talk a little bit about the different ethnic groups. 
When the war began, Muskegon had within the county about uh, three, four hundred African Americans. That was it. Almost all of them in Muskegon or Muskegon Heights. Two sections of town uh, that had a large number. Right, one was right along Ottawa and Western Avenue. Um, it was a fairly um, destitute section of town at that time, and they lived in the apartments above the stores. The other area was along Getty and Sherman in the Heights, and those were the two concentrations. There were some blacks uh, living elsewhere in, in town, especially if they were domestic servants or something like that. In this case, we have a young black man who's working at the um, shoe shine uh, shoe shine stand uh, in one of the buildings that was part of the arcade downtown Muskegon. And of course, that isn't a very good paying job, so he probably got a much better paying job when the war began. Move on to the next. Here again, we have workers. The, the, many of these uh, workers who were black or Mexican American uh, were put into the foundry and they were doing the heaviest, hardest, hottest labor in, in, the, in the foundry. And here we have an example of that. Probably Campbell White and Cannon, another example of the kind of work they would be doing. Move on to the next, please. Here, just we have several pictures of foundry workers in here. Now, again, uh, this uh, looks like an engine block or something like that. Uh, Campbell White and Cannon, or at least a foundry scene. Move on to the next, please. Again, more work being done on a grinding with a grinding mill. Again, pouring. It must be small uh, parts being made. Uh, in that casting there. And again, here's a big camshaft being, again, you probably are aware the, the silver sides uh, motion unit was, was cast here in Muskegon. What do they call it? Drive shaft, probably. Drive shaft. Crank shaft, thank you. Uh, now here we have the Mexican American. Most of our Mexican Americans are actually American citizens uh, from Texas. They were not from Mexico, although they usually spoke Spanish. Uh, they're recruited by Harold Workman or uh, some other uh, local personnel man. Uh, he would go into these places, try to recruit workers. The local uh, authorities wouldn't cooperate with them. Um, they didn't want to lose their workers. They had a nice cheap labor force down there, and they wanted to keep it. And they certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to share it with any place like the northerners. Damn Yankees. So... Uh, they got no cooperation, whatever. They would uh, finally wind up going uh, around town and plastering with uh, posters and telling them about jobs. And, and then they'd use word of mouth. Sometimes they would take an employed workers with them back down to San Antonio and have them recruit with them. So we got about uh, three to 4,000 Hispanics from Texas uh, to come to Muskegon, usually in buses or trucks, or as the next scene shows, uh, oh, sorry, wrong scene. Uh, let's go to the next one. Oh, we don't have the image I thought was in there. Uh, we had a scene, I thought, that showed the train station in San Antonio, and I, did, I don't know which version we're looking at here, but here we have es, uh, Esteban uh, Ramirez. He was um, Connie, another of my collaborators uh, is Connie Navarro. That is her father, and uh, here he is... Uh, interviewing with Harold Workman at Campbell White and Cannon. And I think this may have been a little bit of a put-up shot, you know, because he normally wouldn't wear that sombrero, but, but uh, I think it was sort of designed to attract more workers from uh, down south. Let's move on to the next. Here's Esteban working in the factory, in the foundry. Um, now, what we have here are an, an attempt to show the different um, places of residence. Uh, when these workers first came, they had to find whatever uh, place to say they could. Uh, if they were recruited, usually the recruiter found a place for them. And it was usually an apartment complex over a store someplace. And usually the, uh, uh, the owner of that establishment would work out an arrangement so that uh, he was given their paychecks every two weeks and then would dole it out to them as needed. Um, and this was because, again, I, I'm only telling you one side of the picture. 
uh, it was said that most of these Mexican Americans and African Americans and Appalachian Americans would squander their money on gambling with one another and uh, it'd be better if their landlord kept their money and then doled it out to them for legitimate reasonable purposes like eating and not drinking and gambling but uh, there may be another version of that story too so I, I can't I only heard one side of the issue but they were basically being lodged in the downtown area and in the heights now at the beginning of the war though the federal government began building um, residences for employees and the first one was built actually before the war began called Rudderman Terrace which is I think pretty well gone now but it was the best of them it was designed mostly for management for skilled workers all white no, there were no Hispanics in there or African Americans as far as I could tell looking at the uh, rosters of people who lived there and uh, it was again that red one I'm going to point it out here. I can move? Okay. It's this one right over here. That's, uh, that's Rudderman Terrace. Now, when the war began, uh, the government established a place called Green Acres. Now, it's not the same place as on the TV show, Green Acres. Well, uh, Green Acres was a real crappy place. It was, uh, as you leave Muskegon going north and east, there's a divided highway and there's sort of a swale in between the two parts of the highway. Well, that's where Green Acres was. And it was basically a set of old buses and uh, uh, places like that. And that's where the African Americans were housed initially. As things got better, they abandoned that and they found other places. But uh, this was the old hot bunk treatment. And uh, there you shared a bunk with two other men at eight hour shifts. So you got the bunk for eight hours and then you left it uh, nice and warm for the guy who came after you and then he used it for eight hours and they're working seven days a week. Uh, if they worked, if they did not work on Sunday then they might get that off but typically at least six days a week and, and possibly seven depending on where you worked. So well, that's green acres, all right. It's uh, right, I think I made it green right here, see. Now, going out to the east, that's a place called Ryerson Heights. They put the Appalachians out. There's 45 different buildings and a place for almost 300 families. These are families. Hot bunks were for single men. And they didn't have families. Uh, so this is where they put the Appalachian whites and the Hispanics. The Hispanics were at the far east. They had about nine or 10 buildings and all the other 45, 35 others were Appalachian whites. And uh, the surviving, I interviewed, uh, I interviewed some of the Hispanics. They were just children at the time. Uh, they remembered that it was all Hispanic. Everybody they knew was Hispanic. Well, the uh, city directories disagree. And uh, I believe the city directories against a kid who was five years old at the time. But uh, still, it was a sizable Hispanic community there. And they would have fiestas all the time and dances and singing and had a good time. All right, now further to the east, way out here, I was telling Don Goodman this a little while ago, that is uh, Forest Park or For uh, Forest View, it was called. This at one time had been a graveyard uh, for the city of Muskegon. Uh, it was in the township, but owned by the city. And they had put a few graves out there. Well, not many places in Muskegon wanted uh, barracks for poor workers. Uh, Ryerson Heights was an example of a place where they could go, but uh, that was one of the few. Rudderman Terrace even was in the township, wasn't in the city. So uh, they went out there and they built this uh, complex, uh, mostly for the families of uh, men uh, and women who were enlisted. So if you were in the war, they looked after your family pretty well by putting them out in uh, Forest View. Now that, the only remnant of that is the uh, House of Nor the uh, Sons of Norway building, you know? You've been by it out there just off Marquette. All right, 
And then the other one I want to mention is this one down here. This is the corner of Getty and Sherman in the Heights, and that is where they put the African American community. As we mentioned, they're all part an African American group in that neighborhood, and so they just built a bunch of these um, buildings. Most of them were double wide trailers, though. So, again, all of these buildings, aside from terrace, were meant to be temporary, just to last during the war. Some of them lasted 10 or 12 years after the war but, and were used, but they were not intended to be uh, permanent uh, dwellings. All right, move on to the next. We'll just show you some pictures. When these um, people came into the county, they normally had to find places to live other than in the government dwellings, which were not available right away. So this is a picture of sort of a tenement on East uh, Ottawa. Um, they had money for a car, obviously, and, uh, but it's a pretty disheveled looking place. Move on to the next, please. Uh, now, again, during the war, some uh, private investors decided, well, we, there's plenty of, there weren't any big apartments you know, for uh, middle and upper class people. This is the Hamilton Apartments on Hamilton Street in Muskegon, and it was one of the very nice apartment uh, dwellings built during the war. It still exists, and I guess it's still a pretty nice place. I don't know, it's be 70 years old by now, but uh, that was one of the buildings built during the war. On to the next, please. Now, th again, we're just showing you close-ups on the maps. This is Ruddeman Terrace in what was then Muskegon Township. On to the next. This is how it looked from uh, an aerial view. Again, sort of D-shaped or C-shaped, I guess you might call it. Um, 45 different buildings and with apartments of different sizes. And again, you paid according there, you paid according to uh, the size of the dwelling. On to the next. This is just another picture of the same thing, all right. Uh, on to the next one. Here we have uh, Forest Homes. That's the one out where the Sons of Norway was. And um, again, for the families of, of veterans, the people in the service. Here again, you see the house of the Sons of Norway house in the background. That was their administrative center. I used to know the name of the woman in the front. I think her name is there, but uh, I think she's probably not around anymore. On to the next one. This shows you some of the uh, grounds and some of the buildings in the background. When the war was over, those were still being rented out. And I remember coming to Muskegon in the 60s, they were still being used. And uh, during that, the 60s, a lot of them were sold and uh, taken down and t taken out to oh, uh, Goose Egg Lake and some other places in rural areas. And they may still be there. On to the next. Here we have Ryerson Heights. Again, that's the place for the Appalachians and Hispanics. On to the next. That little black area, that, that shows you the dwellings that were uh, built overlooking the creek. 45 different dwellings. The Mexican-Americans were at the far right. Uh, now, you'll see that these dwellings are not beautiful by modern standards, but for people who were accustomed to being tenants in chicken coops and uh, farm laborers, moving from one place to another every couple of weeks. It was wonderful. This is an example of, of a Hispanic family before they got into a nice place like Ryerson Heights. On to the next. This is what they look like. Now this is the winter of 42 or 43 or something like that. and uh, They don't, uh, they're pretty heavily socked in there with the snow compared to certainly today. All right, on to the next. Here again we have a Young lady, I used to know her name, but I've forgotten. Again, she's uh, shown with the, the uh, Hispanic housing units in the background. Uh, and again, a lot of people had cars. Now, this shows you one of their typical units. There are six different dwellings in this one building. And the, a typical bedroom, for example, runs about 9 by 10. Again, we would take a look. If you're on the, one of the housing channels, oh, we wouldn't want that. That's too small. But... If you're accustomed to something a whole lot worse, this was a wonderful improvement. Plus, they were all heated. They all had a stove. They all had a furnace. 
<clears throat> a lot of these Hispanics are not accustomed to cold weather, and so that heating was important to them. They weren't used to Michigan winters because they were down in Texas by that time. All right, on to the next. This one shows uh, the, uh, the uh, place in the Heights. I um, can't see it very well. Uh, Fairview. Fairview, okay. That's the uh, African-American area. It had already been platted for individual homes, but uh, they just ignored that and put these housing units in there. On to the next. I don't have any pictures of Fairview at all. But this is an African-American uh, uh, residential area in Texas, and it gives you an idea of what a double wide would have looked like at that time. That's the best I can do, I'm sorry to say. On to the next, another example of, of a housing unit in another state for African-Americans. So they weren't so bad. And again, a lot of people did have cars. People had money, and if they could find a, somebody willing to sell a used car, then they would get it. Of course, the problem was finding someone who had a used car. Uh, but uh, people had plenty of money. All right, on to the next. Uh, this, again, is another example of African-American housing in another state. I don't have them for Muskegon. Uh, but this is basically what Green Acres would have looked like, I think. These are basically little trailers that... Um, uh, that's where the hot bunks were. You, again, you just had a bunk next to another guy, next to another guy. And again, they only, only used those for about two years. And after that, they moved them to other quarters, uh, particularly if they had families. Now, we want to do a little bit here with uh, what you did with your money. I mean, particularly following the Depression, people had more money than they could spend. The problem was finding things to buy. And so... If you were working six days a week or even seven, you were anxious to find things to do that um, uh, were other than work. Uh, so one thing you might want to do is to uh, uh, get a ticket to a theater. Muskegon had five or six, seven theaters, and this was the nicest of the lot, the Michigan on to the next. Uh, here's the region owned by the same company. It was also on Western Avenue on the other side of the street. And again, what does it say? I can't read that little message down there. Is that just the name of the movie? Sonia Haney, oh, of course, she was the beauty of, of the ice skating rink back in those days. I don't think they had triple axles then, though. I think they were just up to double axles. All right, on to the next one. Pomona Park. <clears throat> this was um, sort of an amusement park, but what we're seeing here was their uh, main building where they had... Uh, uh, music. Uh, they would operate always on, uh, if they had a local band, like Frank Lockage had his own band, they would uh, work almost a uh, uh, week long. But they were particularly attractive to people who want to see a big band. So all the touring bands would play here. But of course not on the critical weekends, but you know during the week when they're traveling from Detroit to Chicago or something like that. So Tommy Dorsey and Jimmy Dorsey and uh, well, Glenn Miller was in the army and died during the war. But oh yeah, another one if you like Spanish music particularly. Uh, but all the big bands, Count Basie and Duke Ellington, and you could see almost anybody again as long as you weren't going on the weekend. It, the, they, those weekends were for the good big cities. All right, on to the next. Here again is the arcade. Uh, this was a bus depot, of, sort of the central bus depot of town, but there are lots of things to do for entertainment in the old arcade. On to the next. Or you could get the bus. Muskegon had a wonderful bus system, uh, and you would go down to uh, uh, Pier Marquette Park or one of the other places, but uh, this was a popular spot in the summertime. There were things to buy. There were restaurants. There were cold drinks, and, of course, you could go swimming. All right, on to the next. Now, we had quite a few stores. Now, this one is the uh, Hardy, Her Hardy store. It wasn't Herpelsheimer's yet. It was W.D. Hardy, burned down during the war. But what we have here is a lineup of people wanting to buy something. See, so many things were rationed. And as they came into a store, they were sold out within a matter of hours. So if you were downtown and you saw a line forming, you got in the line. You didn't know what they were selling. Didn't matter. Could be shoes, could be gum, candy. Didn't matter because 
Whether you wanted it or not, you're going to get it. You had money, you're going to buy it. If you didn't want it, you could always trade it to somebody else for something you did want. So you get in the line. And here, of course, they're going all the way down the block. All right, here we have the next one. Again, lots of clothes. Again, we're, we're, we mentioned the women. Now, I doubt if this woman here cares about having a short skirt. <clears throat> But most women would be urged to buy shorter skirts because it saved cloth, all right? On to the next. Here we have, this is a Grossman's department store, no longer in existence. But again, look at the crowds. I mean, we don't see crowds like that much anymore. And this was, of course, probably the premier uh, department store in Muskegon at that time. On to the next. Uh, this is where the poor people shopped. It's sort of the Walmart or Kmart of that time. It was a national company, but they sold pretty much uh, lower end items, you know, dollar store, 10 cent store, that kind of thing. We had a Kresge's too, but I don't have that picture. All right, on to the next. Now again, well, the ladies needed to have their hair done. Now this is one of our few African American beauty parlors. This actually was, <clears throat> they not only gave uh, permanence and uh, cut hair, but uh, this was an actual beauty uh, a college, they taught you how to do these things. And so you were taking a little bit of a risk going into a store like, a place like this to have your hair done because it was going to be done by a student. But what the heck, if the price was right, you know, you might as well take advantage of the opportunity. On to the next. Now again, uh, these are some of the cars that you couldn't buy. Um, Americans had started buying cars again when the Depression essentially ended and, and employment started getting better in the 40s. But once the war began, every automobile plant in the country was converted over to some other production, uh, tanks or airplanes or something. And <clears throat> so these are all the models that you couldn't buy. The last model they made was February of 1942. So if you were fortunate enough to get something from 41 or 42, you probably could keep it throughout the war. Otherwise, if you're like my dad, you probably went without. He had a car, but it fell apart and he couldn't operate anymore. All right, on to the next. These are just more pictures. We'll move on. And more pictures. Most of these cars are not being made anymore. They've been replaced with Volvos and Toyotas and, and other brands. Now this guy, his, I think his name is there, he worked for the Farm Bureau. His job was to inspect the farms in Muskegon and Ottawa and Oceana and Uwego counties. So he was on the road all the time. He bought this car in 1941, brand new, with a new set of tires, five tires, one for the spare. They actually had spares then that looked just like the regular tires. And uh, he rotated them throughout the war every month, and they lasted throughout the war. We got 90,000 miles off those tires. And this was a picture from the AAA magazine to demonstrate. He was one of their customers, one of their uh, clients, and uh, very proud of the fact that this is right in front of the Muskegon AAA office. All right, on to the next. Now again, uh, uh, you could go and, and fish at the, uh, at the uh, channel, and we had that up in Whitehall and, and Montague too. So not only was it nice recreation on a nice sunny day, but you couldn't buy meat most of the time, so, but you could eat all the fish you could possibly catch. So the, the channel was a very, very popular spot for anybody who had worms. And of course, you didn't even have to buy the worms. You could dig them up in the backyard. So uh, another popular spot. On to the next. Now, camping was also important, but uh, here we have a family with a huge um, supply of, of meat for the next uh, several days, possibly. Again, just one day's work at the channel. All right, on to the next. Here's the arcade. Again, it shows you some of the things you could do, but I, I have this in here to talk about transportation. Most people didn't have a car or it wasn't operating all year long, so they traveled by bus. That was very, very common. On to the next. And we see some of the buses. I mean, look, they're just lined up. They're, they're coming from one of those residential areas that we showed you, perhaps. Uh, and uh, then they're taking you downtown, and they would have a stop there at the big stores, and then 10 minutes later you could pick up another bus and go on to some other location, or go home if that was your wish. Right on to the next. Here again, downtown, this is the uh, 
Flatiron Building in the left, uh, on the left there. Market Street goes off to the left. Western Avenue is to the right. And again, we see another bus and some of the cars that were running. On to the next, please. Now, here we, we have a family, a mother and son, I guess. Uh, they have to buy something that required coupons. Uh, coupons were very, very commonplace during the war, and you needed them for certain precious items that were being rationed. Uh, it looks like wintertime from the clothing, and this clerk is explaining which coupons you need, because they're very complicated. You had all kinds of coupons. There were four or five different issues of, of ration coupons. I, I brought a few with me, uh, if you want to look at them. I have even some of my own in here. I was born in 1942, so I had a ration coupon of my own. I'll show you mine in a little bit. On to the next, please. This, uh, I don't think, is mine, but it gives you an idea of what the outside of a ration coupon looked like. And then you open it up, and what do you find? Could I have the next one, please? Um, this is, uh, you had to register, and then you got this coupon. This was the first issue, and it had a separate coupon for each item that you might purchase. Uh, so uh, if you wanted a pair of shoes, for example, that might be coupon 18. Uh, if you wanted to buy uh, meat, that might be a different coupon. And you were told which one worked for which item. All right, on to the next. Now, these are uh, coupons for gasoline. Uh, this was the most common. These were red coupons. That's what everybody got. That allowed you four gallons of gasoline per week. And you got it if you could prove that at one time you had a car. So I don't, my dad never talked about this, but he had a car when the war began, but I suspect he kept getting coupons after, the, after he lost his car. And they were valuable because he could trade them for cigar coupons, you know. He, he would go through that as fast as most people would go through gasoline. So uh, red was good, and green was better. You got something like six gallons a, a week for that. If you were a congressman, it was unlimited. Uh, you could have as much gas as you wanted to because, after all, they have to campaign and maintain their contact with their constituents and all that important stuff. So uh, truckers got, a, again, unlimited amount. Uh, this again shows you, uh, uh, this is a ration coupon uh, that you could use for gasoline. The, the, again, the commercial type. They would get more uh, per week than ordinary people. All right, on to the next. This one is mine. Uh, that is not my signature. I was about uh, two months old at that time. But uh, I think on the inside you'll see my coffee coupons. Uh, uh, <laughs> those are my coffee coupons. I... I don't think I use quite as much as other people. All right. All right, on to the next. Now, again, a lot of people used uh, uh, identified a, a plot of land. Maybe they, it was their own. But the city would uh, uh, put aside certain sections of fairly good soil, and you could have your own little plot there. So you could raise your own tomatoes or your own uh, celery if it was a good enough soil or Potatoes or whatever would grow. Potatoes grow pretty well in sandy soil. Celery could grow there, I suppose. Pickles could be grown there. Tomatoes. And so that would be a good way of supplementing your diet, but with a little garden. All right, on to the next. Um, again, everybody's encouraged to buy war bonds. They have little children here because you were urged to send your kid to, to school every week with 10 cents or a quarter to buy stamps and you accumulate them, and eventually you can buy a war bond, which will help the war effort, all right? So everybody gets involved. I mean, this was total war. That is, everybody in the whole community was urged to participate. They couldn't go to war themselves, but they could help out the war effort in other ways. On, on to the next. Again, this is uh, one of the typical propaganda items. They're basically going to shoot that buzzard with a uh, swastika uh, with a... Uh, uh, can't rem I can't read it. What's it say? War bonds. Okay. That's how you get rid of tyrants, you see. You shoot them with war bond uh, devices. All right, on to the next. Now, again, collecting scraps. These were all the things that the war effort needed. Any metal, didn't matter. My mother kept every, every shred of, uh, of um, metal she could get. Uh, if it's something wore out, she would save it and, and take it to the war uh, department in town. Uh, she would save um, 
bubble gum wrappers, you know, made of uh, with the little uh, uh, metal uh, covering. She did that even after the war. Paper, uh, scrap goods, oil, grease, lard, all that stuff. Again, save your cans. They could be converted into uh, tanks or other uh, things that would be used in the war. All right, on to the next. Again, favorite phrase of the time, uh, use it up, wear it out, make it do, do without. I didn't get onto that screen. But here we have some poor fellow and his wife is, it seems to me it would be easy just to have to take them off the pants and, and uh, sew it up that way, but it wouldn't make such a nice picture. All right, on to the next. Now, here, this is a scene from Grand Rapids. I don't have anything. These kids are collecting all kinds of scrap. So they got this old wagon, and the nag had apparently been sent to the, to the uh, meat uh, factory, and, uh, and they're just going around town collecting anything they can for the war effort. On to the next. Here again we have another scene, um, again collecting scrap for the war effort. On to the next. Here we have a couple of young ladies. Now, the car didn't run, but they hitched up a couple of horses to, to make it work, you see, so they're collecting scrap that way. All right, on to the next. Again, uh, we don't think about this, but a lot of the fats could be used in explosives, so that's why they're collecting fats. On to the next. Here we have a woman turning in her... Uh, see, you could buy certain things. Once in a while, you would be able to buy a set of nylons, but you had to turn in your old set of nylons in order to buy the new set, see? And again, they were not pantyhose. I mean, they're two separate legs for the nylon. All right, on to the next. Uh, 50 days. Oh, I think that's scrap paper ad. All right, on to the next. Uh, here we have, oh, this is just a young boy and his mother wrapping up the newspapers to take down to the war office. Now, we don't think about this, but they used um, the, the uh, down from uh, the, uh, the uh, milkweed plants in uh, flotation devices. Um, you know, what do they call it? May West with a popular name. So kids would go out in the, in the late summer, early fall and collect all these milkweed pods and they would convert them to uh, down to be used in, in May West or, or other flotation devices. On to the next. Here we have another woman turning in her, I think, girdle. Uh, that has rubber in it, so it, it, of course it fits the bill. All right, on, on to the She can't buy a new girdle without the old girdle. And here again, uh, this was real popular. There were no nylons, no silk stockings. And so you basically dyed your legs brown and then hired somebody to paint a, a line down the back to make it look like you were wearing nylons because the nylons then were, were, had seams in them. All right, on to the next. Same thing here. Again, notice the short hemlines also, uh, saving cloth. On to the next. Now, again, uh, civil defense. Every town, even Whitehall and Montague, I was monitoring the air for the presumed attack from somebody else. <clears throat> there was not a plane that could travel 10,000 miles at that time. I mean, the Japanese were not much of a threat from the air to Michigan. Maybe the West Coast, but not here. But every town, including Muskegon, had uh, civil defense uh, uh, authorities. They had uh, tin helmets and they climbed to the top of the highest building like the Occidental Hotel or maybe a water tower or in, in uh, White Lake it was the top of the Franklin House and they had this chart and they were looking for enemy bombers or, or, or other fighter craft. Uh, none of them ever were spotted but uh, you never knew. Red Cross, the building on the left is the Hackley House. Uh, during the war it was the local headquarters for the Red Cross. Uh, it was donated to them by the heirs to the Hackley family, and they converted it to Red Cross use. And the next slide shows uh, a, a, a transfusion. They're, they're, they're taking blood, and they will uh, store that and, and make it, put it in a cold environment, and then use it at the front or at a hospital somewhere else in the country. The Red Cross was also used for, um, they would roll bandages, they would knit stock, stockings and mittens for the troops. Here's our, one of our other facilities in town. This is our, uh, uh, I can't read that far. Training, thank the Naval Reserve, it's down near the channel. My eyesight isn't very good. All right, another picture. 
Here's another view of the, uh, of the uh, National Guard Armory downtown with the lake in the background. Another, this one uh, is kind of interesting. It's a, it's a concentration camp. Um, when German prisoners were taken captive, they were often returned, brought over to the United States, and then they were uh, located in various uh, isolated places. The closest to us was up in Oceana County, a little bit to the west of New Era. Now, they had some buildings, but most of the troops, most of the Germans were kept in tents because they were only here in the, in the summertime. They were basically here to till the soil and to uh, clear the, the crops in the fall. There were others up in the upper peninsula and the upper northern part of the state. But we don't normally think of concentration camps here in, in Michigan. All right, on to the next. We're toward the end here. This uh, recognizes the end of the war and then the next one. Um, find, uh, Germans, of course, surrendered first, and there was a big armistice day parade, uh, and then the Japanese surrendered later in the year, 1945. That is one of my first recollections. I was about three, and I was mad at my mother because the parade went down Court Street in Port Huron, two blocks from our house. And I could hear them, and I knew about it, but she wouldn't let me go. I suppose because she had a daughter older than me by a year and a half, and another daughter who was just a baby, and another one on the way, so about two months away from being born, and so she didn't want to take me. Think about how selfish she must have been. <laughs> Not letting me go to the parade. I'm just joking, of course. But uh, So here's the end of the war. This is, again, from the AAA. It shows uh, the, uh, the, the superior forces represented by the ashtray, or right, the allies. You have a uh, cigar, which represents, of course... No, no that's Churchill. But, you're, you're, but the, the pipe represents uh, Stalin and the cigarette holder represents FDR. And then, of course, you have the broken coffee mugs or whatever those are, representing Benito Mussolini in the back there, and then Hitler on the left, and then, uh, I suppose, Tojo or Emperor Hirohito or somebody like that on the far right. Can't quite make it up. And, of course, then the troops come home. This is probably the most famous picture of homecoming. I don't have a comparable one for Muskegon, but this is New York, Times Square, someplace like sailors. And apparently he didn't even know this girl, but he decided to kiss her anyway, all right? And uh, then, of course, this is a Grand Rapids picture, this soldier back home and apparently his wife or sweetheart. And then I think that might be it, all right? I think I took too much time. I'm sorry. Apologize. <laughs> Thank you.